Awesome. Well, happy Memorial Day weekend to each and every one of you guys. As David just mentioned in his prayer, uh, if if you're in this room and you've lost a loved one and they paid the ultimate sacrifice, protection of our freedom for our country, just know our thoughts and prayers are with you today and tomorrow as we celebrate this Memorial Day weekend. Man, what a blessing we have to get to live in a place where because of the, the brave men and women that serve our country, we, we can freely gather and we can worship Jesus. Uh, that's something that we can't take lightly, especially in light of tomorrow. So uh, I know there's some of you in this room that have loved ones actively in the military, but there's some of you who have lost loved ones as well in serving. And we love you guys and we're praying with you today. Uh, if you are new around here, just want to let you know we've been in this series uh, for the last seven weeks. Today will be week eight if I count right, and I don't always do that, but um, for the last eight weeks called New. We've been discovering how we can have new life in Christ. And as we've been discovering how to have new life in Christ, we've been walking through the letter to the Ephesians. Um, And if you haven't been here, let me just kind of give you a quick recap, a quick overview. You can jump online to tribes.church and you can watch any of the past messages if you want to go back and catch up. But we started this thing all the way back on Palm Sunday. If you're counting, that's more than eight weeks ago. But we had a couple of, we had a serve Sunday in between there. We stopped and had a celebration Sunday for baptism and child dedication as well. But we started this thing off all the way back on Palm Sunday and we looked at our old life. And then on Easter Sunday, we celebrated new life in Christ. All of this has been based, if you have your Bibles, on Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 22, it says this, that you're supposed to put off the old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Paul, the author of this letter, the the missional church planter who went all around the Roman Empire, really what is Asia Minor today. Uh, He traveled around and started all these churches. He's writing these letters while in chains in Rome, and he's encouraging this church that he started. And what he's calling them to do is now that you know Jesus, now that you know that he died on the cross and rose again to earn your salvation and also give you new and eternal life, there's this thing that happens in your life, almost like taking off an old coat and putting on an old, a new coat. You're supposed to put off some things in your life and put on some new things as you learn to follow Jesus. And we've been talking throughout this series about how that's an ongoing process. We often trip up and we go back into our old way of life and how we find grace in that, but we're supposed to be pushing that away as we pursue Jesus. And it's not about just doing right versus wrong, but instead being filled by the fullness of God. That illustration I've been using almost too many times over the last several weeks of a vase being filled up with water, just pushing out all of these ping pong balls. Uh, It's not about us doing things right. It's about God through us doing amazing things and bringing about transformation. So we talked then after old life and new life, this series has had a bunch of S words, which was intended to help you remember them. And it was really just brought confusion for all of us. Um, We started with the sealed life, how the Holy Spirit has sealed us. And we have a guarantee of eternity in Christ. We have the seeing life where we talked about the perspective that we're supposed to have in the midst of life suffering, which will come. Then we talked about the saint life, how you and I are all called to be saints and we're set apart as holy. And as we walk in that, we are filled with the fullness of God. In the last two weeks, we had two parts of what I call the shared life. We looked at the shared life in and through our relationships in the church. And then we looked at the shared life in and through the relationships in our households, our marriages, our children, and our parenting, as well as our work relationships. And the illustration throughout all of this was as God fills us to the point of overflow. It's his spirit at work through us using us as vessels to serve others as we share our lives. We give up of ourselves for the sake of the other. The last S word that you'll ever have to remember, at least for now, hope I don't do this to you again in the future, is spiritual life. Today, we're going to be wrapping up the letter to the Ephesians. We're going to be in chapter 6, if you want to go ahead and start flipping there. But today, we're going to talk about the spiritual life. The Apostle Paul gives us this beautiful illustration for life with God, and it is a spiritual battleground. If you have your Bibles handy, we're going to pick up in verse 10 of chapter 6, where it says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So we've got to stop and talk about that for just a moment. So Paul is telling us, really God through the mouthpiece of Paul is telling us that we are supposed to take on the strength of God if we're going to do this Christian life thing. If we're going to 
face the attack of the enemy, if we're going to go into our everyday workplace where we might get ridiculed for this moral behavior that Paul called us into last week as we looked at how our relationship should now look in Jesus, if we're going to live a life worthy of the calling with which we have been called, as Paul said earlier in Ephesians, if we're going to live up to the standard of the scriptures and try to honor Christ and become more like him in our daily walk with him, we cannot do that alone. So Paul reminds us here, that you need strength that comes from the Lord. This isn't your strength. This isn't you muscling enough strength. This isn't you working hard enough or being disciplined enough. This isn't just you doing some religious calisthenics and being strong enough to face the attack. This is God's strength in and through you. What Paul is saying is you need a whole different type of strength if you're going to face this life of faith. You need a whole different type of strength. Ultimately, because what Paul is calling us into is not just a physical existence, but he's calling us into a spiritual life. And this spiritual life, as we're going to read in just a moment, is full of attack and it's full of battle. And I know that scares us and we kind of like step back and we're like, I don't know about all the stuff we're about to read. It sounds creepy. It sounds like an old novel, like the Left Behind series that we read in the 80s and everybody starts disappearing. I don't know what I'm going to do. Um, But it's not as creepy and odd as it sounds. I think we get so caught up in our lives with what we can see, what we can touch, what we can sense, that we lose track of the spiritual in the midst of the overwhelming physical experience that we have. But the world we live in is not merely physical, it's spiritual. Everything is spiritual. In fact, I would say I've gotten to walk with a bunch of families during the highest highs and the lowest lows in their life as as a pastor. It's part of the joy and the privilege and sometimes the difficulty of doing what I do. I have been with families in some of the greatest celebrations. Maybe as a bride is walking down the aisle to a groom and I get to share some words and challenge them to make commitments to one another as they celebrate their love and their eternal bond with one another. And that's a joyous celebration. I've, I've met with families and talked with families as I hear reports about things that we've been praying for for months, maybe a cancer diagnosis and God brought healing or maybe a marriage restored or, or some other answer to prayer. And I've seen God come through in their lives. I've seen times in which people get to celebrate. I haven't slipped up in this sin area because I've been taking steps in recovery. And I get to celebrate with God and with those people in the act of recovery as they grow and become more like Christ. There's been some beautiful celebrations. But there's also been like the lowest of lows. Like I've literally sat with a couple as a husband confesses to the spouse the affairs he's been having and helped counsel them through that. I've, I've sat with multiple families on deathbeds as ventilators are pulled and try to pray with the family and show encouragement and support in those incredibly deep and difficult times. There was even one time I walked into the home of a family who just lost their son to suicide. I walked in this room and the mom looked at me and she said, I don't even want to go inside my house anymore. She's standing in the front yard waiting for me to come meet her. This is just the day after it happened. I don't want to go inside there. The, the, the building just has this heaviness to it that used to be my home and now I can't even think about what happened in there. It, it terrifies me and I know he took his life upstairs. And I looked her in the eye and I said, you know what we have to do, right? We have to go in there together and ask God just to redeem this space because it's just stuff. And ultimately, there was this spiritual weight on that family. And so we walked up the stairs, and we went into his room where he took his life. And the hazmat team had left not long before. And on the ground, there's like, it looks all normal and clean, but there's this section of carpet that was cut out. And so I stood right on the the subfloor, the plywood subfloor, and I grabbed hands of the family. I read a verse, and I said, let's pray together. And we just asked God to step in. We asked his presence to fall in that place. And I can just tell you the reason I'm sharing these highs and these lows is you've, you've been in these seasons in your life. There's these moments in your life where you're like, this can't be all there is. In the midst of the joy and the celebration and the exuberance that comes in the highest highs in life and in the midst of the sorrow and the pain and the depth and the depravity, we realize this can't be the end of the story. This can't be all there is. I know there is more that I can't touch, that I can't see with my eyes that is happening, that is supernatural, that is bigger than I can see right now, that is more than physical. There is a spiritual element to our lives, and we can't deny that in those moments. You and I, we realize that our life is a spiritual life. And we are called into a spiritual battle. And what we believe as a church, we believe that there's this God who created the universe. 
this God, the, the seminary term is that he's metaphysical. He's more than physical. You can't like define him by shape or, or size, right? And so he's this big God who created everything that we live in, this physical container called the universe. And we get to operate in that, but we believe that we sinned. Adam and Eve, the first man and woman, sinned against God and broke his physical world. And so this God of the universe, he did something, and it was his plan from the start. He became physical. He took on flesh and blood to take our punishment on the cross, to absorb our sin and take the wrath that we deserved, the consequence that we deserved. And he rose again three days later. And in that resurrection, he then gives us new life. And as he sent his spirit to the early believers in the church, in Acts chapter 2, you can read about it later, his spirit literally physically dwells within you. So there's this actual presence of God. The, the hot spot of God's presence is within every believer now. We have this spiritual component to our lives because Jesus purchased us for it for us on the cross and in his resurrection. So that thing that we sense, that, that heaviness or that joy, that, that depth to our life that we feel as we navigate our everyday circumstances, we realize is God with us. He was God with us when he became man and walked around and healed lepers and, and, and talked to women who were caught in the act of adultery and turned water into wine and ultimately went to the cross. But he's also God with us, spiritually filling us, as we have looked at in this scripture. In fact, just last week, Paul challenged us not to be drunk with wine, but to be filled with the Holy Spirit, that his spirit is here and it's among us and it's active and it's alive and it's moving. We believe that everything is spiritual because Jesus is with us. We have his spirit here and now. And we face a spiritual battle. But here's the problem. Here's the problem. We don't recognize it most days. We don't recognize the spiritual in the midst of all of the physical. Right? We get so caught up in, like, the stuff, in the morning commute, in the I have to have my cup of coffee or I'm going to kill somebody. We get so caught up in the traffic and the busyness and the schedule and the calendar and the kids' routines and the school and the volunteer opportunities and all the stuff that we just live this physical existence. And we so often just miss out on or forget to recognize the spiritual in the midst of the physical. So there's this God who's inviting us into the spiritual in the midst of our physical existence, but we miss it most of the time. And too often, what you and I end up doing in the battle that we're about to read about, what you and I end up doing is we target the wrong enemy. We, we target the wrong enemy. A couple days ago uh, on Friday evening, um, my oldest is eight now. Dalton is his name, if you haven't met him. Um, he thinks he's too cool for everything. So if you see him, just tell him, hey, your dad's still cool. That would really help me out a ton. Um, so he's eight now. And uh, he got invited to a birthday party Friday evening at DFW Adventure Park. And uh, we played paintball. And I got invited, too. And I thought I was just going to go and hang out. But when we got there, they were like, yeah, the dads can join us, too. And I was like, shoot paintballs at a bunch of eight-year-old boys? I'm in, all right? So we put on our mask and got our guns. And we went out onto these fields. And we spent like three hours playing paintball. And it was an absolute blast. I've never had so much fun with my boy uh, ever. We both have welts to show uh, all of the success and failure that we carried that day. I got shot more than anyone that day. I don't know what it was. I had a target on my back and I have the welts to prove it. But um, there was this moment as we were playing this game called King of the Hill. They literally have, uh, there's this field. I'm not going to try to tell you how big it was. Probably bigger than this room about. Um, and in the middle, there's this big field that's taller than the ceiling. So it's really big, uh, sorry, a hill that they made right in the middle of the field. And all around are barricades, and on the top of the hill are barricades, and the middle of the hill is a flagpole. And the objective is get to the top of the hill, raise the flagpole, and then defend the flag for two minutes. And if you've defended the flag for two minutes, then you've won the game, right? And so a bunch of dads and their eight-year-olds were like, okay, here's the strategy. All right, you boys are going to go that way. We're going to go left. We're going to flank them, right? And as soon as you can get there, you run up to the top and raise that pole, and then we're going to defend it, right? But I'm old and slow. I don't know how this happened, right? Like... <laughs> It, it happened quickly, and so I was taken off running as fast as I could, and I got to the bottom of the hill, and I start seeing fire coming down like paintballs going over my head because they had already taken the hill, and they're in bunkers, so if I duck down, they can't shoot me, right? And so I'm ducking and looking this way, and literally all these paintballs are flying over my head, and the rest of my platoon, is that what we're going to call it? They were behind me that way, right? So I'm just ducking. I'm like, I have no idea what I'm going to do. And I'm looking at them, and they're just getting torn up. All of a sudden, I hear a noise coming around this side, and I'm like, I'm about to die. So I turn around, and there's a kid running right at me around the corner, and I just shoot him right in the chest two or three times, and he's like kind of whimpers a little bit and goes over to the safe zone or whatever they call it. And as he's walking away, I realize something. I was like, that's Dalton's best friend, and he's on our team, and I just shot him. 
oh my goodness. And he's like, he's trying to act tough, but he's got a few tears in his eyes because it hurts and it was like 10 feet away. And um, he was fine by the time I got over there, but I, I went over there and I apologized to him. I was like, Braxton, buddy, I shot you and you shouldn't even have had to leave the game because it was friendly fire and I didn't even realize that you were on my team. But he was coming from the bad side, but I guess he got over there and had worked his way back because he was trapped like I was. And so uh, I, I share that story to say, like, I, I think that's how we live our lives most days. We get caught up in this physical battle when really it's spiritual and we target the wrong enemy all the time. In fact, Paul talks about it right here in verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. What Paul is saying is you aren't fighting a physical battle. And what you often do and what I often do is we target the wrong enemy. And we just start spraying fire often in our exhausted life and we shoot at the wrong person. So when you fight with your spouse, and don't look at me like you don't fight with your spouse, all right? Are you, knowing how this thing works in spiritual warfare, as you were driving into church this morning, you are probably arguing in the car. And so as you fight with the spouse, let's be honest, you, you think you're fighting and arguing with your spouse. And we try to be right and, and win the battle, but you're not fighting your spouse is what this text is saying. You're fighting the spiritual realm. You're, you're not fighting against your spouse. You're fighting against our enemy. We have a very real enemy who has forces that is at work to destroy us and ruin relationships and mess up our marriages. When you're fighting with your boss at work and he's just driving you crazy, you're targeting the wrong person. It's not your boss you're fighting with. It's the enemy of this present darkness that you're fighting with. When your kids make a decision and it just crushes you and you're carrying the weight of their mistake and you're trying to navigate, how do I help them find healing? And you feel like you're fighting against them because they're stubborn and they don't want to listen. The battle isn't against them. It's against the enemy of the dark world. It's against our enemy. And what he loves to do is manipulate and confuse and trick. And more than anything, what he would love to do is he'd love to step onto that paintball field. And he'd love to say, like, jab that person and jab that person and then just kind of back up and see what happens. He wants to get us aiming at one another as if the fight is physical. And so all of a sudden we get into these ruts where we start thinking things and believing his lies and getting into these physical battles. And we start thinking like, if my spouse would just do this, or if my kids were more well behaved, or if I just had a different boss and we get into this physical battle and he just sits back and he watches the chaos. And that's what he loves to do. But what Paul is saying here is you're targeting the wrong enemy. It's not Merely a physical battle. The battle is spiritual and you are on the same team. Quit targeting your spouse. Quit targeting your kids. Instead, realize you're on the same team fighting against a very different enemy. We have to shift our perspective to see the true fight. 1 Peter 5.8 says this, look out, watch out, be on guard. Our enemy, the devil, he is a roaring lion. Right? He is seeking whom he can devour. You and I are challenged by Peter, one of the earliest leaders in the first church in Jerusalem. He's calling us out to say, be on the lookout. You have an enemy, and that enemy is real. You can't see him, but he's there, and he's spiritual, and he acts like a lion. He's seeking whom he can devour. Can I tell you that that might terrify us a little bit, and it gets scary to think about this enemy and this spiritual battle. And so I just want to step back and say this might be a lion, but he's on a leash. God has only given him so long with which he can terrorize our world. I've read the end of the story. I know how it's going to go. It's only temporary, and one day we will have eternal perfection in eternity that will be here and now as God restores all things. You and I, though, we live under his domain for a season. And he is manipulative, he is sneaky, he is a lion looking for meat to attack. He is, as he was in the Garden of Eden, a, a serpent who is shrewd, Genesis 3 says. He's shrewd and crafty and looking for ways to destroy. We don't even have time to dive into it today, but you think of Adam and Eve and how the enemy targeted Eve. If you look back in Genesis 1 and 2, God told Adam, don't eat of the fruit of this tree. Eve hadn't even been formed yet. And so the enemy, shrewd as he was, went to Eve, who didn't hear the direct command from God, and says, did God really say that you can't eat that fruit? He must not love you. I mean, surely it's not going to be that bad. Your eyes will be open, and you'll be like God. Don't you want that? Our enemy is crafty, and he has a way of just 
weaving these lies together that cause us to get into a snare. And so often we start fighting with one another, as Adam and Eve did. Adam, when God shows up, Adam goes, it wasn't me, it was the woman you gave me. She's the one who ate the apple. He skirts the blame and ultimately blames God for creating this wife of his and puts the blame on everyone else. That's what we do. We fight against flesh and blood. Our enemy is crafty, but we have to remember he's on a leash. Romans 8 Um, 38 and 39 says, I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither this, the present nor the future, nor any powers, nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will ever be able to separate us for the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Neither angels nor demons. We have to remember our enemy, crafty as he is, shrewd as he is, he's on a leash. He cannot cause separation between you and God. There is a limit to his power. There's a limit to his control. And while he can put lies in your mind, he can whisper deceit. He can cause you to fight the wrong battle. He is limited in what he can do in the life of a believer. So you need to take heart. The spirit of the living God is within you. The spirit of the living God is more powerful than the spirit of the dark forces of this world. And we have to be encouraged to know that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Uh, Starting next week, we're going to jump into a new series now that we're done with Ephesians called Frequency. Um, And in this study called Frequency, we're going to be diving into Jesus' temptation in the desert. We're going to talk about some things. First of all, that we hear a lot of different voices and a lot of noise in our world. And we're going to learn to cut through the noise of our everyday lives and focus on hearing the voice of God and finding direction from God and living in relationship with him. So it'll be about a couple of things. First of all, it'll be about growing in our faith, spiritual discipline like prayer, like solitude, like getting in the presence of God actively, digging into our Bible so that we can grow in hearing his voice. But secondarily, it's going to be about identifying the voices that our enemy uses to tell us lies. In fact, we're going to discover there's really three common ways our enemy lies to us all the time and we fall into them constantly. So I encourage you, if you're interested in that at all, join us next week as we jump into that series and we look at those voices, those noises that constantly bombard us, and we try to cut through that in order to hear the voice of God. We're going to find out how Jesus did it as he was tempted with the very same big three temptations in the desert. But here's what we have to do. We have to stop falling into the trap. We have to stop giving in to the enemy's schemes, being distracted by things that don't matter. If our enemy could do anything, If he can't get you to fight with your spouse, if he can't get you to be focused only on the physical, the thing that he would most love to do is just get you distracted and numb in life. Rolling through life, consuming what makes you happy and feeling comfortable and missing the mission and purpose that God has called you to. And he has done that in so many of our lives. For seasons, I think we've all walked through that. He loves to distract us and cause us to shoot at our allies. Man, it's Memorial Day weekend, and we're talking about paintball, and there was a raising of the flag, and I'm excited. It's like a manly message today, and I'm excited about that for some reason. But we have to get into the right fight. Um, As Warren Wiersbe said, sooner or later, every believer discovers that the Christian life is a battleground, not a playground, and that he faces an enemy who is much stronger than he is apart from the Lord. We don't play on a playground of comfort. We don't do the Christian life so that we have this just unending grace to do whatever we want. Let me just tell you, we just read in Romans, nothing can separate you from the love of God. Nothing you've ever done, nothing you ever will do. Once you put your trust in Jesus, you are secure in him. But we don't live in a playground. You're missing out on the purpose of life. If you're in a playground in life, when there's a battle at hand, we are so comfortable in our world, but we're missing out on what God has for us. But can I tell you that it's difficult and God knows it's difficult. And so he gave us the rest of Ephesians 6 to wrestle through together. How do we fight? Well, we need to put on some armor. So let's jump into verse 13 and I've got to go quickly because I planned too much. So let's jump in. Verse 13, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, have you heard him say stand three times? I hope you did, because it's been one verse, and he said stand three times. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put 
on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. That means praying for others. Uh, To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am ambassador in chains that I might declare it boldly as I ought to speak. So picture this, Paul sitting in Rome, most likely we believe he's in prison in Rome, and and as he's sitting there, it was very likely that he was either chained to a Roman guard or he was being watched by or, or basically kept in prison by a Roman guard. There was a Roman soldier standing in front of him. And as he's sitting there in prison, he pins uh, many letters to some of the churches he had planted. Ephesians is one of the prison letters. And as he's writing these letters, you think like after a while of just praying and asking God to encourage and lead that local church, as he writes to them to encourage them and teach them from afar, he continues to pastor them even though he's not with them physically. And as he does that, like it dawns on him one day, that soldier standing there is a beautiful illustration of what the spiritual life is all about. We live in this spiritual life, and we need to put on some things. If we're putting off the old way of life, we need to put on the right clothing, the right armor, so that we can step into what is actually a battleground in our faith. And so Paul looks at this Roman soldier, and he's like, man, I I see these pieces of equipment that he's wearing, and it's so much like our faith, like he's got this belt on, and that belt is like the truth that guards our lives. In the first century, a Roman Uh, any Roman citizen would typically wear robes because Levi Strauss hadn't invented skinny jeans yet. And so what they did was they had robes on. And and when you're, you know, lounging around the house, kind of like you might do in sweatpants today, you would keep that robe loose. That was just kind of commonplace. If you were walking, that robe would be loose. But if you're going into battle, a loose robe would get in the way. So you would gird up your robe and you would strap on this belt. And with that strap, you'd have this like flexibility. You'd be able to grab your sword. You could like move your knees better than I can move in these jeans right now. That's embarrassing. Um, (laughs) But you would have this belt of truth on, right? And he says like truth in a believer's life gives them flexibility. What he's saying here is truth in your life actually guards you and gives you the opportunity to go in to battle. Let a lie creep into a believer's life and things just spiral out of control really quickly. It becomes about, did I tell them or reveal that thing to them or or not? I'm kind of having to live this double life and I'm worried about everything I go. There's no flexibility. There's always worry. There's always deception in trying to divert the conversation. But when we live in truth, we have this flexibility. We have the flexibility to take up the other pieces of armor that we need, and we have the flexibility to move our legs as we should so we can be proactive. The belt of truth is a beautiful thing that Paul calls us to put on. Then he calls in this illustration the breastplate of righteousness. This breastplate a Roman soldier would wear literally would go from his, his neck like down to his thighs. This breastplate is one of the most core pieces of protection because all of your vital organs are here. And so to Paul, righteousness or right living is what protects the vitals of your spiritual life. You need to live rightly in order to have protection if you're going to walk with God in a healthy way. And so he calls us to put on righteousness as if a Roman soldier puts on a breastplate. Then he says, shoes of the gospel of peace. Roman soldiers would often have, obviously, sandals back then, because Nike wasn't invented yet either, and uh, they'd put spikes on the bottom of their sandals, and that would give them the sure-footedness they need in order to attack. It was like the first pair of cleats you've ever seen, right? And so they would have those, and it's if Paul is saying, like, there's this solid foundation when you're standing on the gospel. But then he's also saying that the gospel itself isn't just your foundation and your stability. It compels you to action, to go into the world, to have movement, to go and proclaim the peace that God offers all of humanity because he poured out his wrath on his son Jesus for us. He took the punishment we deserve. So the gospel, it compels us to move. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news, Romans calls us. And Paul is saying that here as well. We're putting on shoes of the gospel of peace. He calls us to take up the shield of faith. In the first century, a Roman soldier would typically have this big wooden shield that would be wrapped in leather and soaked in water before they go out to battle because flaming arrows were commonplace in that day. And as they would go out, they could even come together like in the movie 300, right? And they could put their shields up in like a special way to make it, it makes like this little Lincoln log house all around them and protects them really well. And the flaming arrows would come. And as soon as they hit that leather soaked in water, they're extinguished. What Paul is saying is the faith that you have, a deep soul saturated in the spirit of God, it just has this way of extinguishing the flames of hell. 
Your enemy can't attack you when you have a depth of faith, even no matter what difficulty he brings your way, what lie he tells you. There's just this depth to your spirit because you know I have faith and I trust in God in all circumstances. He calls us to put on the helmet of salvation. Think about this. You can't see behind yourself. You have this helmet that blocks the back of your head as if to say your salvation blocks you from having to look into the past, but knowing you're protected from all the stuff you've gotten wrong back there. But it also gives you the vision to see what lies ahead. So through your salvation, you can do what God has called you to do. And finally, the only offensive weapon he calls us to take up is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, to get into our Bible and to use that against the attacks of our enemy who's going to lie and deceive and trick us into to fighting the wrong enemy, the word of God, his spirit in and through the word of God and speaking into our lives is the only offensive weapon we have. And we're going to talk more about that weapon in our next series. And this is a beautiful illustration. If we ended the message right there, it would be enough. It would be a beautiful illustration. But can I tell you, I think we miss the point of that illustration all the time. We, in the 21st century American church, we're so self-absorbed. We read something like that, and we're like, man, I need to do all this stuff. I need to, like, put on truth, and you do. Like, that's a good takeaway. I need to, like, walk in the salvation that I have, the gospel on my feet. Like, that's a great and beautiful illustration, but we miss something when we read it that way. Really quickly, we got to go back to Ephesians 4. Starting in verse 15, we read this a couple of weeks ago as we opened up the idea of the shared life. Paul gives us another illustration that ties in eerily similar to the one he gives us in the end. Verse 15, rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. So we're supposed to, as believers, grow up in Christ. We're supposed to mature. And who is Christ? Well, he's the head of what? Well, I'm glad you asked because here comes the illustration. Verse 16, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Just verses before, he called the leaders of the local church to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry, to become the body. So so my call is to equip you to grow up in the Lord and use your supernatural gifting to come into this place, not just in this building, but in the church, to use your gift to make the body of Christ be equipped and built up, to live on mission for him. And so Paul gives us this other illustration of the body here in Ephesians, chapter 4. And then in chapter 6, he says, now put on the body, put on yourselves all of these things. And we read it as Americans in the 21st century and say, I need to do this stuff. But Paul's saying, no, we need to do this stuff. In fact, let's go back really quickly to Ephesians 6. I don't have time, and it's way too technical, but it's really fun. So I'm going to teach you a grammar lesson really quick before we go. Um, We're going to learn about second person plural today. Second person plural. You guys good with that? That sound exciting? Anybody? Oh, I'm excited. Okay, second person plural. So English is terrible at this. So let's kind of work through it. In English, we have first person singular. So first person meaning I am speaking and singular. I'm speaking about myself. So I, my, like I own that, my, right? Me. That's first person singular. Good? Okay, first person plural. Our, we, like I'm a part of the body who's speaking, our, we, my, ours, there we go, ours, man, that was challenging, first person <laughs> plural, so we've got that so far, now let's talk about second person singular, you, right, pointing at Brad, right, you, that's second person singular, second person plural in English, you, that's complicated, right, there it is, welcome to Texas, we have solved this problem in the great state of Texas, have we not? We've invented a word. And if you're from the North, right, it's you guys, which I use all the time. And forgive me because I was born and raised here, but I didn't want a Texas accent, so I never took up y'all. But the truth is, in the great state of Texas, we have solved this you second person plural dilemma. Y'all. And it works perfectly. You all. Y'all. It's one word and it's second person plural because English has no first and second person plural delineation like most other languages do. All of the languages in the scriptures, Greek, Hebrew, even Aramaic, they have this second person, second person plural and singular delineation. Even when they like, remember if you took Spanish class, even when they conjugate verbs, right? Even in tenses on the verbs, adjectives and verbs take on singular or plural in the Greek language. It's fascinating. And so you learn a lot of grammar as you try to study this stuff. And English is complicated, but we've solved it. Now, have you guys heard uh, the super Texan, all y'all? You guys heard all, that's literally makes my head want to explode. All you all, all y'all. So all y'all get in here. It's, it's always accompanied with fixing to, or I might could. Have you guys noticed that? All y'all, I'm fixing to come in there. All right, so 
That don't use all y'all because there's no language in which that one is appropriate. But the purpose is y'all gives us this beautiful second person plural. So I'm going to get real text in real quick for you guys. And it's going to be fast, but I'm going to do it. Every single you in Ephesians 6, in fact, almost all the time when we read the scriptures, it's you plural. It's so rarely you singular, but we always read it me personally. It's amazing what the printing press and modern technology as we get this book in our hands has done to our community and our understanding of faith. It makes us so individualistic. But um, everything here, every verb, every adjective, when Paul says you, he says you plural in all of them. So let's just go through it. Finally, y'all be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. I can barely do this with a straight face. Y'all put on the whole armor of God that y'all may be able to stand against this game. Skip down for we. Oh, he said that plural, so we're good there. I underline it still. Uh, 13, y'all take up the whole armor of God that y'all may be able to, even able was, was you plural, uh, to stand in the evil day. And y'all having done all, wow, that was complicated. Um, y'all stand, y'all having fastened, y'all put on the breastplate of righteousness uh, and you Shoes on y'all's feet, having y'all put on the righteous. I mean, we could go on and on. There's like six more. I think I counted last night. I don't remember how many I counted. There's at least 10. Every single time that Paul is addressing these people, he's not saying you do this. He's saying y'all do this. He's already talked about how when you come together in the local church, you create this body. And God does something miraculous in and through you. He equips you to do things for his namesake that can only glorify him because individuals aren't getting the glory. And as we do that properly, he brings on these things that we're supposed to take up corporately. The truth which which we're supposed to speak to one another is like a belt around our waist, giving us flexibility as we relate to one another. The helmet of salvation reminds us that everything that we have done as a group and gotten wrong in the past is protected. The shield of faith that we have, again, it's a communal exercise that we would have depth of our faith as we face the arrows of our enemy. The call is not for you individually to muster some strength and to pick up some equipment. The call is that we corporately would be known by one another, would be growing in our faith, and that God would be continuing to build us up and that he, through his supernatural strength, which is what Paul opens this section with, that we would be strengthened in the Lord, that he would equip us with some armor. Not so you and I can be really tough and make it through our everyday lives, but so that you and I can be part of a body that changes the spiritual landscape of our community and our world. And as we come together and do that, no longer is it about us targeting one another and getting into these debates and discussions about who's right or what we should do in the life of this church. It's all of a sudden about unity and the namesake of Jesus. No longer is it about the issues going on in our marriage and us attacking one another, but it's about the spiritual enemy that we're fighting against and asking God to bring us ever closer into one flesh and that the marriages in our church would be flourishing and healthy and growing and making an impact and living as an example in all of the broken marriages we see in the culture around us. It is about us coming together. It's about y'all. And that is the last time I'm going to say that. So we don't fight our spouse or our kids or our neighbor or boss or anyone on I-35. Our fight is against the spiritual rulers of this dark world. And as we come together, God does something profound in and through our gathering. You are called into community to take a stand and fight. You can't do it alone. None of us can. It's time for us collectively to start targeting the right enemy. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for the truth of your word and the reminder that you are calling and equipping us not just individually, you've redeemed us and forgiven our sin and are intimately known relationally with each of us. You want a personal relationship, but God, you have called us into a people to be a body, to be equipped to do good work. And God, I pray that you would give us every piece of armor and every weapon and tool that we need to make advances for your gospel in this community. Would the spirit of God, the very word of God, go forth from this place? Pushing back the spiritual darkness in Northlake, in Argyle, in South Denton, in all of our surrounding areas. Holy Spirit, would you do what only you can do as you build this church? Jesus, I ask that your spirit would fill the individuals in this room that most need to hear from you today. If there's anyone in this place who doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, would you just call them home? Remind them that you love them, that you died for them, and you want to give them a new life on mission and purpose for you. 
which brings so much more fullness and satisfaction when we realize that we're living in the source of our identity. God, I pray for any couple struggling today, any marriage on the rocks or or parenting situation that might be happening or, or work situation where we individually face spiritual crisis every day, I pray that your comfort, that your peace, that your spirit would overwhelm those moments and remind us, A, we need our people, we need our body, but B, we need you daily. So God, I pray that you would equip us, that you would remind us, that you would walk with us, that you would lead us, that you would fill us to live the spiritual life. That's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, before we go, a couple quick pieces of announcement, and then we'll get out of here. Um, First of all, David mentioned this earlier, but if you are new, a couple of options for you. First of all, I would love to meet you and just say thanks for coming. We've got a small gift for you. So before you leave, whenever that is, you'll go out the lobby. You'll see an info table on the right. We'd love to give you a, a small gift and just say thanks for being here. Also, if you're interested in knowing more about who we are and what we're all about, we call ourselves tribes because we want to be all about this body of Christ thing, all about community. And so after service every week, we have people breaking into their tribe, which is what we call a small group. Right here in this room, we provide child care for, it would be 30 minutes if I didn't talk so long, um, but uh, for the next 25 minutes or so, and they're going to do that in this room in just a minute. If you're here and you're interested in just sitting in on a group discussion, uh, where are Jim, Bob, and Cindy? You raise your hands right there. Blue polo, right? And I, don't, I can't see what Cindy's wearing, but I'm sure it's lovely. Um, uh, they're going to they're gonna be right over here by this cross. They're going to lead an open group today. I know there's several of you who are looking to get in a group. Maybe you've just finished We Are Tribes. Hang out with Jim, Bob, and Cindy today. Get to know them. They'll be launching the next tribe we have. Um, If you are ready to take that next step and get connected around here and find your tribe, like get connected to a tribe long term, as David mentioned, we have that class called We Are Tribes. Just go to the big welcome home banner out in the lobby and we'll get you checked in for that. Also, um, one quick piece of uh, housekeeping. Uh, Nicole asked me to just make sure you guys all knew. Nicole's my wife. She runs our kids ministry. I don't know if you knew that. Um, She asked me to make sure all of you guys know, don't start tearing down the kid space until all the groups are done meeting, until everyone picks up their kids, because you don't want your kid still in a room where it's not secure and safe, right? Everybody can get on board with that. So don't start tearing down in here or in there until after groups are done meeting. I'll discuss, I'll dismiss you guys for that. Um, Lastly, tribes, you guys will be doing the Lord's Supper today, because it's the fourth Sunday in your tribe. There'll be instructions on the screen for that. Let me know if you have questions. Finally, if you're in this place and you need prayer for anything going on in your life, or if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior and want to talk to somebody, we've got some people on our prayer team that can kind of make their way up front now. They'll be standing right up front here. They'd love to pray with you, put some resources in your hands, and just help you on your faith journey. Would you guys stand as we get ready to dismiss? I think I covered everything. Um, Before we leave, you know, just look at your neighbor and tell them, it's good to see you all this morning. God bless. It's good to see you guys.